last night I was on YouTube, and as you watch videos, YouTube will recommend videos. Okay, connected, same tags or something in the title and stuff, or you know, another cartoon or something. And a little clip from a cartoon in the mid 2000s from the Legion of Superheroes cartoon that was on back in the day. Something I thought was real surreal. What well, was even more surreal is they had Fear Lad in the cartoon. Fear Lad, you say? What's that got to do with the first black superhero? Hang in there. I hope this pays off. A little comic book history here. But the clip I was watching was the death of uh, Fear Lad that they took from a comic book in the 60s written by Jim Shooter where he kills the Sun Eater. Now, let me take you on a little trip here, a little storytelling here to get to the whole concept of why this is, you know, this video is, you know, got something to do with the first black superhero in comic books, okay? We're not going to be talking about Ivory White and the Spirit. We're not going to be talking about uh, the great EC comic story, Judgment Day, you know. If you don't know what that's got to do with, uh, you know, <clears throat> with, uh, you know, black people in, in comics and you need to go read the story. We're not talking about uh, the character from the Howling Commandos and stuff back in the day. We're talking about actual superheroes, you know. So, basically what happened was there was this kid named Jim Shooter. If you don't know who he is, go look him up. And he was 13, 14 years old. Family needed money. I think he's from the state of Philadelphia, if I'm remembering right. Family needed money. So what does this kid do? In the middle of all the counterculture that's going on, all the, you know, drop out, tune in, drop out kind of stuff, talk, the drug culture, the counterculture, the, the hippie movement, the, the Vietnam, uh, you know, rebelling and being worried about going to Vietnam and stuff like that, this kid gets a job. He gets out white paper, he draws little boxes, little word balloons, and draws some figures, and he mails it in. So it can be, you know, the Legion of Superheroes. And Legion of Superheroes has always sort of had a cult following in the comics. That's why it's survived over 50 years. And I think Jim Shooter probably picked that book because, you know, it probably wasn't really that popular at DC. You weren't messing with any of the real icons, per se. You know, Superman and Superboy and Supergirl popped up, but I mean. But anyway, he sends it in. And uh, he gets a call from, you know, Mort Wessinger, I think it's his name. And that was a big-time editor at DC back in the day. And he's talking to Jim Shooter on the phone. Doesn't realize how young this kid is until he starts talking to him on the phone. And he just come up to the DC offices and he talk. You know, well, I don't know. You know, and finally Mort's like, uh, "Kid, how old are you?" And he tells him, and he says, "Put your mom on the phone." Do they fire him? Do they let him go? No, they bring him in on up. And now all of a sudden, a kid in the middle. You know, the 60s there, gets to go to DC offices and he starts more or less getting trained and shaped and talked to and stuff like that and keeps writing. And uh, DC offices back in the day were a lot like uh, the TV show Mad Men if you look at him. He showed up in white shirt and a tie, hair combed. You know, this place was a business, you know. You get the stories out, get the books out, you know, deadlines and all the stuff. It was a job. I mean, you had bosses and you had umbrellas and stuff, right? So this kid got brought up by these old school guys where, you know, it was pretty cold and impersonal, you know, on a lot of stuff, you know. I mean, you know, it wasn't hell to work at, but I mean, you know. So, uh, Jim Shooter's different than his contemporaries. You know, first of all, he's younger. And I'm talking about his contemporaries like Marv Wolfman, Lynn Wine, Steve Englehart, Gary Conway. These guys who were raised on comics and loved comics and weren't ashamed and wanted to work in comics because comics was just not something you admitted to work in, in back then. A lot of people lied about their job, a lot, a lot of people used pen names and stuff. And uh, the difference between Shooter being so young and working for these guys and these other guys, you know, they kind of let it all hang out. They were kids of the 60s and stuff. And they were actually put, rumor has it, you know, legend has it, these guys were actually put, when they arrived at D.C., put in a back room, you know, kind of hid from some of the other good guys and stuff because, you know, the hippie thing and showing up to work without a tie just wouldn't float, but they were good at what they did. All these people ended up at DC, at Marvel. And the shooter admits that, like, you know, DC was a place where you went to work when you arrived at Marvel. 
they had like streamers. I don't know the way they explained it. it looked like there had been a party there. It looked like a frat house. You know, they had streamers and I heard a pinata and you know the stories go on and on. When Jim Shooter walks into the mar, you know, the office of the Marvel, and there's like a writer slash artist and people sleeping under their desks and stuff. And he's like, "This is home." Through the seventies, I kind of find it interesting. That I've kind of tried to dodge the whole question of who's better, Marvel or DC. I'm a DC guy, but it doesn't mean I hate Marvel. Is because editorial was a mess back in the 70s at Marvel. A lot of people don't know that. They had Archie Goodwin try to be editor-in-chief. Roy Thomas tried to run the place. They put Marvel Wolf and Lynn Wynn as co-editor-in-chief trying to run the place. and Nobody could get the place you know, to act together there. But then they put Jim Shooter on there. And Mr. Jim Shooter, who had been molded and shaped by that, those old school guys over at DC, was able to make them get their shit together. And we got... I didn't work for... Jim Shooter's get a, got a bad rap. I didn't work for the guy, but I think what that company did, Marvel did in the early 80s, speaks for itself about where he took them. Dark Phoenix Saga, Frank Miller on Daredevil, John Byrne, you know, Demon in a Bottle with the Iron Man. You know, he'd listen to people. If they had the story, he'd let it go. If he didn't think it served the characters and protected the company and protected these characters, he stepped in, ruffled a lot of feathers and, you know, Heard he had a god complex there for a while too, so I didn't work there. Anyway, so this kid, before he gets all the way up to editor in chief, he's working on. Uh, for, he's a teenager, 14 years old, working on Legion, and in uh, Adventure Comics, that's where the Legion was was at at this time. Adventure Comics number 346. It came out in July 1966, the same month as Fantastic Four number 52, the debut of the first recognized black superhero, Black Panther. Okay. And uh, there's a lot of things in comics where, you know, kismet hits. And DC and Marvel put out a book in the same month or around the same time where people had to wonder, is this a coincidence or are they ripping each other off? Man-Thing, Swamp-Thing, Doom Patrol, X-Men, you know, two biggest ones that pop in my head. And this could have been, you might be seeing the seeds on lane here, this could have been the same thing with Black Panther, Panther and Fury Lad. Fear Lad, if you look at him, debuted in that same month at Adventure Comics with uh, three other characters that Jim Shooter brought into the book. Karate Kid, Nemesis Kid, Princess Projectra, and Mr. Fear Lad. Mr. Fear Lad really stood out because he wore armor and a full, you know, metal mask, iron mask. And if you look at this on my bookshelf, you know, it looked a lot like that. You know, there's probably a picture up I'll put up. And he started off first thing he was going to do is that there's a traitor in the Legion of Superheroes. And the clue started pointing out it's one of the class of 66. You know, one of the, you know, new guys here. One of the, you know, one of the young bloods in the Legion there. And if people read those books in the 60s like I did in the early 80s with the same experience, Fear Lad stuck out because he wore that mask. He was a bit more mysterious. He could turn to metal. They were laying seeds down to where he was really being her heroic, but he was kind of still pushed in the background. And what happened was is that Jim Shooter had an idea for this character, and he was told, no, my Mort. And since they weren't going to let the Jim Shooter do with Fear Lad what he wanted to do, he's like, I got another story where... I need to kill somebody. Of course, the traitor ended up being Nemesis Kid. And uh, he, he became Earth Man. You know, he's kind of still stuck around, you know, a couple years before DC-52 hit. And, but, I do this. But uh, he came up with this plot where the, uh, uh, an alien called a Controller released a Sun Eater that was going to destroy our sun in the future. And with the, just to give you the bare bones of it and stuff, they needed a lot of firepower. They, the Sun Eater was so powerful and so dangerous, they went around, they got the five worst villains, you know, that they had at the time to try to help them out, you know, get their resources in. Fear Lad actually saved uh, Mano, I think it's his name. This guy was on an alien planet, and they had him in a guillotine to pay for his crimes, and he turned to metal, and he stuck his hand in there and stopped the guillotine, saved Mano, and brought them all up. Nothing... You know, ever so you got the Legion of Superheroes, you got Superboy who's been hit with uh, red solar radiation. You had all these, nothing was working, but somebody had a bomb. And this bomb was going to have to kill the Sun Eater, but it had to be placed right there with the Sun Eater, so somebody was going to die. Superboy steps up. Fear Lad, remember this. Fear Lad, cold cock Superboy says, You're still too weak from that radiation. Give it to me. 
and he freaking flies out of there and goes right into the big cloud of smoke right at the sun eater man and it's this big dynamic death before death meant nothing in, in comics you know since you know the 80s and all that stuff and it was dynamic and this guy was dead i mean he was going to get hit with the uncle ben slash bucky rule at the time you know dead is dead bucky stays dead uncle ben stays dead well feral lad died in a way that was heroic and dynamic and huge and he say he became a legend in the 30th you know the future there in the 31st century and stuff for taking out the sun eater and saving billions uh, that, you know, this bomb went off and his atoms and the Sun Eater's atoms were scattered across millions of miles of space. There was no coming back. Now, we go back to why why all that just, you know, seems cool, you know, death and, you know, death still wasn't new, you know, it wasn't used as much in, you know, in comics at this point, but it's still amazing. And all this happened in seven issues. Uh, Adventure Comics 353 was the death of Fear Lad. So, this hero that shooter brought up that he decided to kill and what does this have to do with the first black superhero well it has the fact to do with here's what shooter's original idea was he was going to write a story in a way that the big reveal was fear lad was black he was going to take off you know his mask and in the future this was no big deal that there was a black uh, superhero who's a member of the legion of superheroes you want to see that it was not a big deal. That's a bigger statement in my mind than making sure that you know that the Black Panther is not only black, but he's African. Uh, the first um, African-American superhero that's recognized is uh, the Falcon that popped up in 1969, three years later. Uh, you got it wrote down here, Captain America 177. And then you had these other characters come in that were kind of, I don't know, man. You had a, a Black Goliath, and you had... Luke Wilson, uh, not Luke Wilson, but Luke Cage as Power Man, who, you know, I read some of his early issues, and I'm like, wow, you know. Um, but the whole thing is, is that here's what you did. If you read Fear Lad as a black superhero, they let him cold cock, um, you know, the ultimate Boy Scout, Superboy, and it was no big deal. He was a hero. Uh, it didn't matter that he was black, you know, in the future, things like that don't matter, and it makes sense, because look at all the alien races and from all the people of all the planets and you know yellow blue green uh the spectrum of colors that they were and all this stuff right and it's all what could have been and why did mort wessinger say no to this idea and it made jim shooter say i'm just gonna go ahead and kill my character if you're not gonna let me do it because he was afraid of losing distribution in the south he could have been right i don't know you know the time fit the time period fit so yeah it could have been so anyway there you go first black superhero that is recognized Black Panther, first African-American superhero, Luke Wilson, and what could have been with Fear Lad. So, take with that what you will. Just a cool little comic book history.